Hi, I'm Caitlin Hopkins, and you may remember me as Kilana on Deep Space Nine and Dala on Voyager, and you're listening to Trek Untold. Welcome to Trek Untold. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz, and welcome to our official debut episode. It's been a long road getting from here to there, but I kept my faith in the heart, and here we are. If you missed our preview episode and you're totally new to the series, let me give you a quick briefing on what this show is all about. Trek Untold is a weekly guest-driven podcast that goes beyond the stars. Now, what does that exactly mean? Well, this podcast is all about the people who aren't seen on the bridge in any given episode of a Trek show. We're talking about the character actors, the stunt performers, directors, VFX artists, writers, behind-the-scenes people, and everyone else who makes the Star Trek universe what it is today. This is about celebrating their contributions and educating fans about who these people are and what they did for Star Trek. It's also about discussing their other work that you may or may not know about, because these people are the backbone of the industry, working their butts off to elevate the stars we see weekly, and who often don't get the credit they deserve. But here on Trek Untold, we give them some of the accolades that they've earned over the course of their career, and I hope listeners like you can enjoy these discussions and hopefully learn a few things too. As for today's episode of Trek Untold, well, you could call this one the art of negotiating with Starfleet. Our guest has gone toe-to-toe with two Starfleet captains, once as a diplomat and later as a swindler. And that guest is Caitlin Hopkins. Chronologically speaking, Caitlin was actually the very first guest I spoke to when I started making this podcast, and she was a really great person to start with. Caitlin has appeared twice on Star Trek series. First, she was on the Deep Space Nine episode from Season 5 called The Ship, where she played a Vorta named Kilana, who was tasked with recovering a crashed Jem'Hadar ship from Captain Sisko and his stranded, starving, and injured away team. A few years later, Caitlin showed up on Star Trek Voyager in the episode titled Live Fast and Prosper from Season 6. There, she played a con artist named Dala, who, along with her two-person team of hustlers, are flim-flamming people around the galaxy while pretending to be the crew of Voyager. That episode is a real forgotten gem, so much so, in fact, that The Hollywood Reporter recently wrote an article about that specific episode, complimenting how good it is. Caitlin's career goes far beyond her time in Trek, and you may have seen her perform in TV shows like Law & Order, Diagnosis Murder, Murder She Wrote, Spin City, Jag, and so many others. She comes from a family where performing was not only in her blood, but surrounded her every day. It's rare we get to speak with a guest who grew up around an Academy Award-nominated mother and a father and stepfather who were both critically acclaimed actors and playwrights. Caitlin's also had a tremendous career on stage, which has led her to the path she's on today as an educator in one of the finest musical theater programs in the country today. Caitlin Hopkins is an absolute wealth of knowledge, and we're going to get a little taste of that today. But more importantly, she's also a legit Trekkie who has a lot of great memories from her time on the sets of Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Because Caitlin has this background in education, I decided to use that as an opportunity to ask a lot of questions about her acting process and acting theory. So this is going to be a really great episode in particular for folks interested in acting on stage and screen. Now, I do want to make a little note because we recorded this interview a few weeks in advance of it debuting today. Uh, And during that time, unfortunately, her mother, Shirley Knight, passed away on April 22nd. So we do talk about her quite a bit here in this interview. So I wanted to send my condolences to Caitlin and her family during this tough time. We may not be enrolled in Caitlin's musical theater program, but I can say we're all lucky enough to become our students for the past hour or so today. So again, thank you, Caitlin, for being so generous with your time and information. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Trek Untold. One word, no spaces. You can also support our show by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold. If you're already following us or offering your support in any way, thank you for your help. Most of all, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a rating and review wherever it is that you're listening to it. This helps more people find us and hear the show. And I'd also like to make a quick shout out to our friends at Triple Fiction Productions, who make some great 3D printed Star Trek inspired products for toys and people. But you're going to hear more about them a little bit later. Now, without further ado, let's beam up this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. Affirmative. Initiating program. All right, welcome back to Trek Untold. This is your host of the show, Matthew. And joining me on the other line, we're now speaking with Caitlin Hopkins. You guys might remember her from her appearance on Deep Space Nine and Voyager. But her career spans far more than just two episodes of Star Trek. Uh, So we're going to run down pretty much her entire gamut of her acting, singing, theater, everything career. Uh, Caitlin, how are you today? 
Oh, I'm just fine. <laughs> Doing very well. It's lovely to speak with you. Yes, well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I like to start the show with the same question I ask every guest. Uh, and Caitlin, what is your earliest memory of Star Trek? Oh, wow. That I love that question. Okay, my earliest memory of Star Trek, and I love that you asked me that because I wouldn't have thought of it. And the minute you said it, I had this like memory flood back to me, which is so such a gift. So I grew up in England for the most part. I, I was born in Manhattan. I was born uh, in New York. And I moved with my family to England for about 10 years when I was like three. And I remember the house that we lived in in England my father, my stepfather, I should say, John Hopkins, who was my, who raised me, um, was a massive, massive Star Trek fan, like massive geek, uh, and the original Star Trek, of course, because that was like the late, gosh, would have been the mid, the late sixties. So, um, anyway, we used to, as a family, sit in the den in front of the fireplace and watch Star Trek. And my dad, I mean, just would never, ever, ever miss an episode. And so my sister and I grew up watching the original Star Trek with William Shatner. And, and uh, that, was, that was my introduction to Star Trek, was growing up in England and watching it with my dad. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, how you grew up in the environment that you grew up in, because it was basically surrounded by these creative working professionals who were very prolific during their careers. Uh, your mother, Shirley Knight, she is an Academy Award nominee, two-time Academy Award nominee, in fact, a Tony Award winner, Golden Globe winner, Emmy nominee, among many other acclaims and being in so many different shows, movies, theater sh productions. Uh, your father was the late Gene Pearson, who was also an actor and producer for film and stage. Uh, and you mentioned your stepfather, John Hopkins. What was it like for you growing up in an environment of just not only creative peoples, but prolific working professionals in this field who I believe also work together a bit? Yeah, it was um, my family all worked together a lot. Um, my stepfather was also in show business. He was a playwright and a film and television writer. Um, you probably know some of his work. Uh, he wrote some of the James Bond films, uh, Thunderball was one of his uh, big films. And, um, Goldfinger, uh, and, and he wrote a lot of uh, miniseries, TV series, films, and, um, and they all got along terribly well and worked together a lot over the years. Um, what was it like? I mean, you know, it's funny when you, when you grow up, however you grow up, that's what normal is, right? <clears throat> that's what's familiar. Um, I always think of my, my upbringing and my childhood really fortunate in the sense that I got to travel all over the world because my parents were always traveling, shooting films or doing plays or whatever. And I really had an opportunity just to see the world from a very young age and be around so many different cultures and people and, um, and around art. You know, my, my parents were huge music lovers and art lovers and the ballet and the opera and the theater. And my stepdad was just an obsessive old movie buff and Star Trek fan. And so, um, it, you know, I, I feel like I was very lucky that I had a lot of exposure to the arts. Um, and so I think it was sort of inevitable that I would find my way, ultimately, that my path would also lead me down uh, something that had to do with the arts. So I imagine that you were privy to being able to visit a lot of sets, either theatrical productions or TV shows or movies. Uh, do you have any memories that stick out of you visiting any of these productions? Oh, sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, I was around Tennessee Williams a great deal because my my dad produced a lot of his plays and my mom acted in a lot of his plays. And of course, he was one of our great American playwrights, Streetcar Named Desire, Glass Menagerie. I just, I have so many memories of Tennessee. I have a lot of great memories of um, Sean Connery, who spent a lot of time at our home because my dad was involved in those, uh, those James Bond films. Paul Newman and Joanne Wood, his wife, Joanne Woodward, were people that, you know, I spent a great deal of time with because he and my mom worked together. Her first Oscar nomination was for a film that they did together called Sweet Bird of Youth, which was actually a film version of one of uh, Tennessee Williams' plays. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have so many memories that, that sort of, um, I guess for, you know, other people, it sounds very glamorous and stuff, but for me, they were just friends of our family, 
You know, it was always fun going on sets. I, I especially enjoyed when I would get to go on movie sets where there were other kids. So like when my mom shot Endless Love and it was like Brooke Shields and Jimmy Spader and Tom Cruise were like played smaller roles in that film early in their careers. And so, you know, I got to hang out with a lot of kids who were the, in the industry and that was more fun than hanging out with grownups. I was really uh, close as a, a little girl with Matthew Broderick because our parents were friends. Um, you, you know, so you sort of, I don't know, you, you know, I just liked being on the movie sets where there were other kids. So I wasn't so bored. <laughs> Oh, that's very fun. I wish I was around all, all those big names. It's funny how far all you guys have come since then. Yeah, yeah. So obviously you were around acting and all of these different elements of creativity in the arts, but when did you first get bitten by the bug to actually become part of this world? Um, my dad produced the original production of a musical called You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. He was the original producer of, of that show and the revival. And um, I think you know, I was about four, maybe, when that show opened. Uh, and so I sat through so many rehearsals and just what felt like hundreds of performances of that show. I must have seen it a zillion times, knew every word, knew every song. And so from the time I was like four years old, four and a half years old, um, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, it hit me, it you know, bit me really hard, really young, because, of course, can you imagine a four or five year old getting to sit through seeing Snoopy and Charlie Brown and Lucy, you know, um, Charles Schultz had a huge influence on my life. Obviously he was a very dear friend of my father's and I spent a lot of time with him as a young, a young girl. And so, you know, peanuts in general have also had a huge, huge impact on my life. And, you know, years later, I'm um, now I'm teaching and directing. And one of the things that I, I did recently was produce, um, a revised version of sort of the sequel to that show called Snoopy the Musical um, that uh, that we have a new licensing on that show now. Um, yeah, I just, uh, the other thing that kind of really did it for me other than that particular show as because I was so young was my mom used to take me to acting class with her. She studied with Lee Strasberg at the Actors Studio and, you know, people like Jack Nicholson and Geraldine Page and Kim Stanley and, you know, just so many of our famous actors, Al Pacino and Dustin Hoffman, like we're all of those people that sort of those great actors in the day um, were in that acting class. And I used to sit and watch them do scene work for hours and hours and hours and became sort of fascinated with the process and the craft of acting um, really, really intrigued me. And I think probably those early experiences watching Lee Strasberg teach at the actor's studio probably influenced me as a director. Uh, I didn't know I wanted to be a director, that I would become a director producer, you know, 30 years later in my career after I sort of got bored of performing. Um, but uh, I think that those were, you know, those early experiences watching Franco Zeffirelli direct, um, you know, watching some of our great directors and playwrights, um, at work, I was always observing. I was always, you know, sitting in a director's chair as a little kid watching, watching. And so I think that really informed the direction that I went in my life. Yeah, it sounds very lucky to not only just have parents who are in this industry, but also then to be around such big luminaries as well, like Lee Strasberg. Yeah. So again, like, but having parents, especially who are doing this, must be amazing to have. Uh, so I'd just like to know, being around them and other people, what were some of the biggest lessons that they had instilled on you from their career and their knowledge? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a blessing and a curse to have a family in the arts. The good news is they understand what you do. The bad news is they always have an opinion about it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> My mom used to come to shows with like a little, you know, um, stack of post-its and she would just, you know, take notes and I was always taking notes for her too from the time I was really little my mom always wanted to know what I thought of the show that night or the scene or um and so my mom and I have a very interesting relationship in terms of how we helped each other um in our process as actors um but I think I don't know I think some of the, the greatest lessons that my family taught me is that 
being an actor, being an artist, it's not who you are. It's just what you do, right? It doesn't make you special. It doesn't make you any better than anybody else. Your job is to be of service. It's a service industry. You're there to heal humanity. You're there to um, offer perspective, you know, to your storyteller. Like, that's what you do. And our culture celebrates celebrity and celebrates fame. But, you know, really all we're doing is storytelling. And that's a, a age old art form, you know, going back thousands of years. And I, I think what they taught me is it's really important to have balance in your life, to make sure that you know what's important to you. That doesn't have to do with um, what you do for a living, you know, but, but having, having balance that your life can't just be about pursuing your career or, you know, making it on Broadway or getting a TV series, you know, like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of focus in our culture around fame and money and celebrity. And I think it's important that, you know, my parents really taught me that you have a platform to be an activist, to support things that you care about, um, to give back to community, your community, to just to give back in general. Like it's not about you. That's what my parents taught me is that being an actor isn't about you. It's about being of service to other people. Um, and that's been something that I think as a teacher that I try to instill in my students too. You know, it's, it's really important that you understand that there are things that are more important in the world than, you know, playing pretend and telling stories, you know? I mean, look, we're in the middle of a, of a world pandemic right now. And, uh, you know, you have to have perspective about what's important. Yeah, it's a very good perspective to have on it. And uh, so to follow up on that, you continued your education in, let's call it storytelling, in this case to encompass everything, um, by studying musical theater at Carnegie Mellon and then uh, acting at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London. So I'd like to hear a little bit about who your teachers were and, again, what were some of the lessons that really stuck with you throughout your career? Yeah, my education was very interesting. I, I went to Carnegie Mellon um, for a year and a half. I did not graduate from that program. It's a wonderful program, one of the best in the country. Um, but I had opportunities as a young actress to, um, I was cast opposite Christopher Walken when I was like 20 in a play that sort of changed a lot of things for me um, professionally. And I had grown up in show business, obviously, and had had so many great teachers along the way as a young person that um, by the time I went to college, I think I was just ready to start working. And I wanted to continue to study with teachers in New York and London. And so I, I didn't end up staying in school. But, you know, I had I had amazing teachers along the way. Um, many of them were people that I worked with, you know, who were older and wiser. <laughs> um, but I had a I had a voice teacher. His name was Douglas Decatur. And um, we met in Los Angeles when I was a young, young actress, just uh, shortly after I left Carnegie Mellon, actually. And he, he had a huge impact on my life. So many of the people that I worked with did, but, but Doug in particular uh, taught me about how your, your instrument you know, your vocal instrument is an opportunity to share your light, your gift with the world. And that, and again, I think kind of similar to what my mom taught me that it's not about me because I used to get terribly nervous when I would sing and Doug said, but it's not about you, is it? You know, you, what you're meant to do, you're, we're all meant to do things in our lives. Um, and most of us are meant to do many things like, you know, be parents or um, mentor or, you know, do service work or whatever, be political activists, like, you know, or be husbands or wives or daughters or sons. Like we all have many hats that we wear in our lives. Um, and I think Doug just helped me build my confidence as a singer. And that translated into my acting as well. He really taught me how to be confident in who I was and bringing uh, myself to the material um, so that I could impact, you know, audiences. 
And that was a gift that, you know, I, I sort of used in a lot of areas, areas of my life, not just my, my work as an actor, right? I think, you know, somebody helping you figure out who you are and helping you become confident in who you are, those are the greatest teachers. It's not about what they're teaching you. It's about how they're, how they're teaching you. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's a really great gift that he gave you that I'm glad you're sharing on this show today, especially. Mm. Let's fast forward a bit now. You make your TV debut on One Life to Live. Uh, you had a regular role in Another World. Uh, at that point, I believe then you moved to L.A., where you started to pick up more work on shows like Beverly Hills 90210, uh, Gabriel's Fire, and, and My Life and Times. But uh, the show that I want to talk to you about in specific would be uh, one that your mother also appeared on, and that's Murder, She Wrote with Angela Lansbury. Oh. <laughs> Yes. And uh, that was episode uh, from season 11, which was titled An Egg to Die For, which I believe you play a friend of uh, Angela's character, Jessica, where you own, I, I think it's a bookstore. There's a Fabergé egg involved. It's all kind of craziness. But uh, basically, you were you were side by side with Angela for that entire episode. So I just would love to hear what it was like being on set and working with Angela Lansbury. Oh, my gosh. Well, she's an icon. She's an absolute icon. And I was in awe of her and I was terribly nervous. Um, and she's such a generous woman, Matthew. She's so generous, so loving, so supportive, um, you know, so willing to take a young actor under her wing. And she offered advice and she was just um, charming and made me comfortable and made me feel safe. And, you know, we just had a blast. We just had so, so, so much fun. Um, doing that episode. And, you know, it's funny when you're talking about like icons like that. I had the same experience when I worked with Dick Van Dyke on his TV show, you know, just like Angela, like these are two people who had been doing this for decades, you know, and just the amount of joy and passion and commitment that they have to the work um, was so inspiring to me. You know, she is, has such elegance uh, and class. I mean, that's what I remember about her most is just that, as one classy lady. Now, as I mentioned, your mother also worked with her an episode. So was your mom like, oh, say hi to her for me or, or anything like that? Was she giving you any advice on how to handle <laughs> Angela? <laughs> um, no, I don't. I mean, I don't remember that. But, you know, it was sort of hard for me to ever go to a film or TV set or start a show where somebody didn't say, you know, hey, say hi to Shirley, <laughs> you know, or hey, how's your mom? How's your dad? You know, because, you know, you just kind of know everybody when you, it's, it's sort of a, a small business in a funny way. Um, even if you don't know people personally, you know, you sort of know them indirectly through other people. So, uh, you know, Angela, I remember Angela saying, how's your mom? And give her my love and, you know, that sort of thing. Same thing happened when I did the Law and Order show, you know, and Mariska was like, how's your mom? I'm like, oh, my God, you're Mariska. Oh. You know, I was like, I think she's such a terrific actress. And I had so much fun working on all the Law and Order shows. And uh, my mom had, had done an episode of uh, that TV as well. That's for you. That's for you. Oh, my God. That's God. You yeah, know. Your mom was on SP. I think she's on the same ones you were on, in fact. She, I know she did three yeah. episodes, I believe, as well. Yeah, I think I think we both ended up doing an episode of all three of the shows, like the original <laughs> one, CI. And so that was kind of fun. I was like, hey, mom, I'm keeping up with you. <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk about all those shows a little bit later. But now we're getting closer to uh, reaching Star Trek. But before you got on to the Trek shows, there's one other thing I was curious about. Uh, that's going to 1995 now. You were on a two-part episode of Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Oh, yeah. Which was the episode Cooper versus Quinn, season five. Uh, and you played the role of Lillian Cooper, who was the wife of... Uh, Dr. Quinn's original husband. And so the episode is a two-parter about basically him coming back to take custody of the children. Uh, it was a pretty intense episode. And so I just was curious about what it was like working on that set, working with Jane Seymour, uh, and also just really since that, most of that show is produced, it seems, outside. Uh, just, you know, what that whole production is like. It seems very unique. I loved working on that show. I love Jane Seymour. I love Jane Seymour. She is amazing. That whole experience, I had the best time. We were outside the whole time. You're right. And, you know, it's definitely, that's uh, what I'm going to call rustic and rugged. You know, you're in the middle of, you know, the mountains, like shooting this TV show in, uh, in basically in Malibu, um, up in the hills. And um, it was just a blast. Everybody on that show, again, a lot of joy on that set. You know, you don't always, 
not every TV show has a has a healthy, positive environment, but it always starts at the top, you know, and the series regulars on that show were just happy to be there, grateful to be there and welcoming to the guest stars. And so, you know, I really felt like we made made some great art. You know what I mean? Like I felt like we really, really did some good work on that show. And I was very proud of the work I did on that show. And yeah, had a great time. That was a fun set to be on. Really fun. So the year is 1996, and Caitlin Hopkins, at last we have reached Star Trek. So uh, your <laughs> first episode okay. first episode for you was on Deep Space Nine, and that was Season 5, Episode 2, the episode titled The Ship. So let's start at the beginning. How did you become cast for this role? Uh, my agent got me an audition, uh, on the, and I remember the audition was on the Paramount film lot in Hollywood, and I... I thought I was going to pass out when my agent called me and told me I had an audition for Star Trek because it was my dream job. It was one of my like bucket list, like goals. I'd been saying to my agents for several years at that point, I'm like, please, 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 you have to get me an audition for this show. I really, really want to be on the show because I'd been obsessed with Star Trek since I was a little girl because of my dad. And, um, and I just, really really wanted to audition for it so they got me an audition and uh I I'm just not sure I ever worked on an audition as hard as I did on that um and I went in and obviously did well enough to book it and um I remember just calling my dad and just like crying and just saying I did it I'm on a Star Trek show and feeling like I had won the lottery (laughs) because I was going to get to you know around all these amazing actors and I I really feel that that particular episode was one of the best written episodes um I mean that I deep to be signed in general I mean all the Star Trek shows let's face it they have some of the best writers in the industry but those deep space nine scripts are absolutely off the charts and that particular episode I thought was really innovative really brave and really exciting dialogue because basically it was just two people having a negotiation for the entire show, right? Like it, it, it was very, um, I don't know. I, I thought it was really exciting and I had an opportunity because I guess they hadn't really had any female Vorta on the show. I'm not sure if I was like the first one or the second one or something. I know that I, I, I remember that it it was a really, really big deal that they got the look of the character right. And so I got to go to the Paramount set numerous times and they tried, you know, all types of different costumes and different wigs. I have a couple Polaroids of some of the different wigs that they tried on me before they ultimately, you know, restyled it a bunch of times and ultimately settled on the look that they wanted. Um, And that was exciting for me because I felt like I got to be part of the process of helping create the, the look of, of that particular um, character, which was really thrilling. Um, And I remember them doing fittings for the contact lenses because they were like hand painted kind of violet, like everything on, on that character was sort of violet colored, you know, with the ears and everything. Um, and so I, I had to wear these terribly uncomfortable, like, you know, handmade violet colored contact lenses. <laughs> and it took like four hours to do that makeup. It was no joke. And we shot in the middle of the desert and it was a hundred and easily 115 degrees that day. And Avery Brooks and I we're standing on top of the ship, right? Or right next to it and on top of it for a good number of those scenes. And it was metal. So that heat was like going down into that metal ship and like bouncing back up onto us. It was so freaking hot. You have no idea. That should be illegal. Jeez. It was so hot. But what was funny, I mean, it's not really funny, but it was really pretty funny, Matthew, is that the two Jem Hadar actors, right. That like stand behind me for the whole scene with him. One of the, the costume that they have on their head, right. It's all rubber. So those poor actors, I mean, they must've been just sweating through their costumes, but 
all of a sudden in the middle of the shot, like we're, I, I didn't realize it, but one of the actors behind me fainted and fell out of frame. So one of those Jem Hadar, like they're both standing there. And then all of a sudden, like one just falls out of frame and faints because it was so hot. <laughs> and Avery works with, and they had to yell cut. And I'm like, what happened? And Avery's like, um, I think your guards just passed out. And I was like, oh my God, it was so, it was, I mean, it was awful because it was, you know, you worry about people getting heat stroke and actually getting sick. But when you go, they, Avery and I went and watched the like replay, you know, they'll have like little mini TVs and they'll rewind and you can watch the scene that you just did. Um, and I got to, to see it happen on camera and it really was very funny, you know, just to suddenly like have this, <laughs> this huge actor, right? They're very tall, like just fall out of frame. Um, that's the thing I remember most about that whole day. And Avery Brooks and I sitting when we were waiting to shoot, just talking about Shakespeare and, you know, having these amazing conversations about acting and classical theater and Shakespeare and Chekhov. And, you know, he's, he's one of the great theater actors. Um, and so to have an opportunity to, to talk with him for hours about plays and about theater and about great roles that he has done that he wanted to do that that was that was a real treat for me you know um i would say that episode was probably the thing i'm most proud of that i've ever done on television it was a great honor to be in that episode i'm on that show and i was really really proud of that episode it's, it's a very interesting episode it's very unique from all the other d space nine episodes in particular from a lot of the points you mentioned yeah, that's what I'm saying. It was very different. It was very unique. And I think that it was very brave because, you know, to hold an audience's attention on television where basically it's just two people talking about a ship is really interesting. But I think the message of that whole episode was, I don't know, there was just, it was, it was such an interesting character, I think, that they created for me to play. Very complex. complex. And I think that, you know, I think her and uh, Avery, you know, in another point in time might have had a relationship. Call me crazy. I think there was a little bit of a flirtation there. <laughs> oh, those Vorta, they're very charismatic people. <laughs> now, your, your character in particular, she was named uh, Kilana. You touched up uh, a lot on the makeup you had to do for the show. Um, and that you were, I believe, the second female, actually, to play uh, a Vorta character. Was I? I think yeah, so. Yeah, I knew I was first or second, yeah. Definitely early on yeah, there. And I knew that, I think... Yeah, it was definitely early on. I just sort of, you know, vaguely recall that that they either wanted to sort of make changes to how the female Vorta were being portrayed, you know, or they wanted to, you know, um, make some new creative decisions of, about the look of that of that particular um, species and that character. So that was that was pretty exciting to be able to have all those fittings. And oh gosh, you know what I just remembered? I have not thought about this since I did the show. Um, but because we were talking about the costume fittings, I literally just had a flashback to when I went to do the fitting, they put me in like this small fitting room, but it was attached to what, what would have, uh, how do I describe it? It looked like a big warehouse. It was on the Paramount lot, but it was huge. And you know, those, um, you know, when you go to the dry cleaners, the electric things that they hang the clothes on, it's like a track and they press the button and the clothes come around. Okay. So it was that but imagine it like the size of a football field. Oh my God. <laughs> and it was, I mean, that, it probably wasn't that big, but you know, that was a lot of years ago and I was pretty uh, impressed by everything that was happening. And so in my, in my, in my uh, memory of it, it was a, a huge building, right? And that track, and there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Star Trek costumes on those tracks. And they would press a button and you would just see like all these Starfleet uniforms like flipping by you. Right. Um, and I was, I couldn't even believe it and because they have a Bible for everything. Right. So, you know, that every single one of those costumes is like documented of like who wore it and what episode. And it was, it was incredible. Well, I would be awestruck if I saw that for sure. It sounds just tremendous. It was really thrilling. Now, this episode that we're talking about, The Ship, was directed by Emmy-nominated Kim Friedman. She is, again, very prolific in her own right as well. It's directed dozens upon dozens, I think hundreds of TV shows, in fact. 
uh, and has done 10 episodes of Star Trek, 6 on Deep Space Nine, 4 on Voyager. And more importantly, she's also one of the few women directors on Deep Space Nine who actually directed multiple episodes. So uh, I'm curious if you remember anything at all about working with her and what it was like being directed by her. Because I've heard she was a very well-prepared person with a, a game plan in mind of things that she wanted to achieve for each episode that she did. Yeah, I actually remember working with her really, really well because it felt like she was really, really clear uh, the relationship that she wanted Avery and I to play, right? Like she, um, and she was very collaborative. She wanted to hear our ideas and how we were approaching it. Um, but yeah, she was very specific. Um, she was very efficient. I remember that, right? Because, you know, those are long days and you're shooting in the middle of the desert and, you know, um, she was very efficient with her time. Um, she was very focused, uh, and you know, you, you could tell that everybody on set really respected her. You know, you, you could really feel, um, that energy of, of that. And for me as a young actress, it was very exciting for me because I haven't worked with the with very many female directors in television. Most of the people I worked with were male directors. And so for me, um, it was really inspiring and exciting for me to see a woman in a position of power. And, you know, certainly on a, a show of that caliber to have a woman directing it um, was, you know, just inspiring for me because I, at that time was thinking, gosh, I wonder, I wonder if I could be a director someday, you know, and, and seeing another woman doing that um, made me feel like it was possible for me to, to do that someday, you know? So, Caitlin, I now have for you what's going to easily be the nerdiest question I ask in this entire podcast episode. There's a moment in the episode where you are eating something called key lava. And I just want to know, do you remember what the heck that was? Oh, my God, that's so nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that as a compliment. Um, uh, yes, you should. You should absolutely take it as a compliment. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, I don't think I do, but I bet if I go back and I watch the episode, I bet I'll remember, but off the t you know, I think I would have to like look at it and I might come back to me, but I don't remember off the top of my head. All right. Well, I hope that you do because the world needs to know us Star Trek nerds out there. We need to know what it was at the Vorta yes. eat for snacks. Okay. I'm going to go back and look at the episode and I bet it will jog my memory. <laughs> I hope so. Now, uh, you, you've discussed a lot of working with Avery Brooks in this episode, and so I just want to get a little bit more details about your time working with him and sharing the screen with him. Uh, I've heard that he's a very intense person. He brings a lot of power to the role and a lot of seriousness. So what was it like playing back and forth with him in all of your scenes? Like a master class in acting. Like a master class. Like, his energy, his persona is so big. You know, like, it, he that intense is a good word. Um... But, you know, not intimidating, right? Like there, there are people who have strong presence and are kind of scary and intimidating. Um, he wasn't. He, he exudes a collaborative energy. So you're really in the world with him and in the scene with him. And what I appreciated about him was that he was so fully committed to um, the world that we were creating. You know, um, that's what you get with great Shakespearean actors, right? Like they're all in all the time, you know. Um, I felt challenged in a really good way, right? Like I, I was going to have to rise to be my best self to hold my own opposite someone of that caliber that had that level of gravitas in his work. And it was exciting. There was an electricity and an energy between us. I felt like we listened and responded really well to each other, and we had a great time. Um, and we spent a lot of time, you know, while they were setting up the next shot and stuff, talking about the relationship of these two characters and what the episode was about and, you know, uh, what we wanted to accomplish, you know, in the scene. Like, what, what did we want the audience to walk away uh, feeling about this interaction that these two humans have um, and what was important to both of them. So that, yeah, I mean, that, that was just, like I said, I, I don't know how to describe it except a masterclass. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to watch because, as you mentioned before, this really is it's a conversation, but it's really a back-and-forth dance of negotiating between your character and Captain Sisko. Uh, and, you know, I find that Avery Brooks, especially on Trek, was always best when we had, like, an antagonist to bounce off of. And you were just, again, another great antagonist to have in the series. You were just wry. Uh, you always had something sharp to throw back at him. There was, of course, all the secrets that both of your characters had. Uh, so I just found it just a very interesting dynamic that you shared on screen. Mm, thank you. Well, I, I think what you just said is uh, really interesting to me and really true, which is that well, I think one of the things that made that script so great was that all of those secrets were written in there. That's really exciting to play, right? When you have a secret as a character and when you are trying to one up each other in a negotiation and it felt like climbing a staircase with Avery playing the scene, right? Like he would up my character and then I would up his character and I would throw a little, you know, something back at him. And it felt like a, like a really good tennis match is what it felt like to play the scene. And I'll never forget it because that's not common. You know, that's very rare that um, in film and television, at least uh, for me it was, you know, where I, I, I had not had many opportunities to play that caliber of dialogue with that caliber of actor where the construction of the scene, that negotiation and that one-upmanship and the secrets, all that, uh, made it so complex and so interesting. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props or toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film, or a part of a cosplay, or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Triple Fiction Productions taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. If you find yourself listening to your favorite podcast and wondering what microphone they use or how they do their editing, or if you watch a YouTube video and you wonder what camera is that, or going one step further, if you're watching Twitch and you're wondering how your favorite Twitch streamer built their rig and if you can do the same, then Toys and Tech of the Trade is for you. Toys and Tech of the Trade is an interview series where we sit down with content creators, entrepreneurs, and discuss the gadgets and gear that they use to create their content and run their businesses. We use toys in a broad sense, meaning the stuff that just puts a smile on your face, whether it's action figures to something a little bit more complex like musical instruments, cars, you'd be surprised what people consider their toys. Toys and Tech of the Trade can be found on all major podcast providers, including iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and of course, Spotify. Feel free to visit us at RageWorksNetwork.com to check us out. We now return to Trek Untold. So the ship first aired on October 7th, 1996. And Caitlin, I have to imagine you were watching this episode when it first aired. So if, if you did, uh, can you tell us what your reaction was and what your family thought of this episode if they watched it too? Well, my dad was so proud. I thought he was just, you know, I mean, I think he went to his, my stepdad, like went to his grave, like really happy that his daughter had been on Star Trek. Um, <laughs> so he was just really proud. He invited all his friends over to watch. It was a very big day in our house. I remember thinking that my boobs looked really good. Well, that's an important thing to think about when you're on Star Trek. Well, you know, here's the truth of it. I actually don't have very big boobs. But on Star Trek, they let you have really big boobs. <laughs> they like pads. They, 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 and I was like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if I actually had that figure that they made me look like I had? <laughs> and I, it actually reminds me when I did the Voyager episode 
there was a scene that was cut where I played seven of nine and they made me look like Jerry. And I was like, Oh, this is like the best day of my life that I get to pretend to look like her for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of like no, the prerogative um, they had on Star Trek was any female characters. They had to be skinny and have big boobs. If you had that, you were set. That's right. That's right. And if you didn't have it, it was okay because they built them into your costume. This is what I'm saying to you, you know? So it was kind of fun. It was like, oh, I can play it having big boobs for a day. No, I remember, in all seriousness, um, I remember watching the episode and I was very emotional. I remember that I cried um, because it felt special, you know? That, that was one of the great experiences of my life as an actor, getting to play those scenes with Avery Brooks. Like, uh, you know, it was one of the great moments of my professional career. So I just remember feeling proud and like I was part of something. You know, I think for anybody who loves Star Trek, you know, you, you're you part of something. And, and that's, that's a really cool thing. To, to be part of a legacy of something, even a tiny, tiny part, like I'm a teeny, teeny part of this great legacy, this great storytelling that has happened now for decades through these characters and the, um, the stories that the Star Trek shows tell, you know, are, they have hope, they have morals, they have a message, they have, you know, they, they're challenging us to look at ourselves. They're holding up a mirror to people's character. And they're really almost always across the board. Star Trek is telling a story that involves integrity, right? And to me, that's why I'm so proud is because to me, there's nothing more important in life than having integrity. And to have a show that has had such a global impact that is resonating on a profoundly deep level about one of the most important character traits that we can have, loyalty and integrity, then, I'm, then that's something to be proud of, that you were part of telling that story and reinforcing that message to our communities, our culture, the global community, that friendship matters, that loyalty matters, that integrity matters, that love matters. That standing for what standing up for what you believe in matters, and that it's like there's just not an episode you can find that at the end of the day isn't telling isn't saying by the way standing up for what you believe in is important and other people's perspectives other people's worlds other people's cultures are valuable and it's not your mission to interrupt with that to to mess with that right your way isn't the only way or the best way you have a, a human responsibility to have integrity in how you treat other cultures and other people and that's something to be proud of any of us that had the honor and the privilege to be part of the star trek series we get to you know we have that we did that I got to do that. And who I am and what I stand for in my life, to be able to reflect that in another piece of in a piece of art is pretty cool. Yeah, and it's really great to be able to talk to an actor who's worked on Trek who just really appreciates it as much as the fans do. But uh, again, your journey with Star Trek is not done yet because you have one other appearance, and that would be in Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> so we're jumping ahead to the year 2000. Uh, you were on okay. season six, episode 21, which was Live Fast and Prosper, where you played the character of Dalla alongside Francis Guinan and Greg Daniel, where you played a team of con artists who are flying around the galaxy, setting up flim flams, pretending to be the crew of Voyager. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that episode. Um, again, how you got the call back. And let's start over there. Just how you got the call back to do another series on Star Trek. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I think I just got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I just got called in for the audition and I remember, here's what I remember about the audition and what I thought when I was working on it, I thought I need to really be able to sound like and impersonate Kate Mulgrew, right? The way she sounds when she says, welcome to the Federation, right? Like I need to be able to do that really well. <laughs> in order to book this job. 
And I spent hours, I'm not kidding, Matthew, hours watching her say welcome to the Federation, like over and over and over again in preparation for that audition. And I remember in the room when I said that, I remember all the producers in the room, like either looking up, smiling or laughing. And I was like, oh, I just booked that. <laughs> <laughs> I just booked that job. Um, so that was fun. And, uh, and the only thing that like is so sad about that experience was that one of the uh, Starfleet, you know, people that I was impersonating because the episode was long. They cut the scene where I had a whole scene where I was impersonating seven of nine and, and, you know, they literally like the wig, the costume, the boobs, the whole thing. I mean, it was, it was so, 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 so fun. And I was so sad because gosh, wouldn't it be great if that footage still exists somewhere in the fans and me, if we could all see that scene that got cut, I wish they would do that, you know, cause that would just be, that's like the only thing that made me sad was that that scene didn't end up in the actual episode. Well, I'm sure it's somewhere in their archives, but for, for us who still can't see it, can you actually describe what that scene was? Well, I wish I could remember it, you know, such a long time ago. I mean, it was, it was short and I don't, I don't really remember like the, exactly what the scene was. I was just, um, you know, once again, like trying to con everybody. And I think the, I think the thing that was most fun was the wig I got to wear as Captain Janeway. That was fun. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that, in fact. It was, so cause there is a part where you take off a wig and we see the alien's head underneath it. So I'm just curious, the scenes where you are wearing hair, is it actually your hair or is that a wig the whole time? It was a wig the whole time because they, they then had like the prosthetic um, Polonian. I think that was my, my species was actually a Polonian. Um, you know, they, they had that when they had like airbrush cool stuff on the, in essence, it's in essence, it's a bald cap, right? But they're like creating the prosthetics and then they put the wig on top of that. So this episode was directed by LeVar Burton, who I'm sure all of our listeners know as Jordi LaForge. And he's directed plenty of other Star Trek episodes, among other things. Uh, but can you tell us a little about what it's like being directed by a Star Trek veteran like, like uh, I was going to call him Jordi LaForge, but, but like LeVar Burton. <laughs> Okay, well, that really was uh, a little bit of like I was fangirling the whole time. You know, it was it was a little unnerving to have him be the person that was directing it, you know, because I was uh, I admire his work a great deal, not just as an actor um, and a director, but just as a person like I, I really um, have a great deal of respect for him. And so I was I was a little nervous. I won't lie, you know, but he was um, charming and funny he ran a very efficient set again like um you know he, he just is so confident and just knows the characters in the world so well that you felt I just felt in very safe hands because I wasn't really sure how they were going to want the scenes played you know I basically just came prepared to take whatever direction he gave me and uh you know play the scenes a bunch of different ways you know, depending on how they wanted it to to read um, and to be willing to play. You know, I felt like my job in that episode was to be playful uh, in how I was thinking about the character so that it could, you know, be sort of deliciously fun. Um, but yeah, working with him was like kind of a, again, like a dream come true. I couldn't believe my luck. Yeah, and I think play is a very appropriate word here because you really got to play off of so many more actors in a very different, more lighthearted way than you got to do in your Deep Space Nine appearance. So, again, we mentioned yeah. you're working here alongside uh, your two other flim flam artists, if you will. Um, you also get to have some time with Ethan Phillips, who played Neelix. You got to do some interesting scenes with him, and of course, Kate Mulgrew. So, uh, I just want to hear what it was like working with all of those people and uh, who you found the most interesting to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was such a different experience in the Deep Space Nine episode. Um, they were just completely different experiences. And, you know, this one was inside on a set, right? So that already was very different. We weren't in the middle of the desert on location. And I was interacting with so many more people. Um, and so it was, it was a little more, I'm going to call it like a, a broader experience. Um, what I loved about the Deep Space Nine experience was how intimate and personal it was because it was really just Avery Brooks and I doing our work, you know. And then in Voyager episode, 
it was interesting, you know, you're, you're sort of part of a bigger machine, you know, right on a, on an episode like that, where really you're, you're there to, you know, serve the, serve the story to sort of fit into the machine that's, uh, that's shooting that day. Um, and just sort of, you know, show up wherever you're supposed to be and, and be playful and, uh, and be present, you know, it was fun to interact with that many people but there wasn't as much quality time with each person. So you had to work faster. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, the, interesting, these yeah. Design, like, you know, it's just you and another actor pretty much all day. So you have a lot more time to develop a relationship off camera that then you can take on camera. So there was the difference. Right. And then in Voyager, I didn't have as much time with the actors to, develop a relationship, right? We were really doing that in the moment on camera. So now since you've worked on Deep Space Nine and Voyager, you had the ability to work with both Avery Brooks and Kate Mulgrew. So uh, I'd just like to hear what are the differences between acting with each of those actors? Well, they're, they're definitely really different actors, but they're, they, the thing that they have in common is their, um, their sort of intense, um, energy, you know, like they're like Kate, Kate is, you know, playful too, but very focused, you know, very professional, um, very present, you know, um, and very meticulous in how she approaches her work, which I really respected and was excited. It was interesting to watch her process, um, which is very different than Avery's. Avery likes to sit and like talk about stuff. And not necessarily the scene, you know, like uh, I think it's about him wanting to develop a relationship, you know, with you and, and sort of see who you are and what you're about so that you can, you know, then develop a, an on-screen relationship that has a little bit more depth to it. Um, you know, and Kate is very, um, that's the word that keeps coming into my head, like meticulous, right? Very um, organized and sort of in her approach, it was very um, like fun uh, and she knew what she wanted and, you know, we, we just had fun getting to know each other and, you know, laughing a lot. And when we weren't on camera, yeah, I mean, it was just, she, she was just fun. I thought she was really fun to be around. Now, I think the most fascinating thing about the character that you played on this episode is that to begin with, you're playing a con artist, that's your character, but you're playing a con artist who has to impersonate other actual actors that are on this show. So it's basically a role within a role. So from an acting perspective, how do you handle that type of role where it's like the duality more so that an actor typically has to handle? Well, I will say that I think had I not been a huge fan of the show and had I not seen every freaking episode of that show prior to the one I did, you know, um, I think it would have been much harder. But I think it's probably why I did well at the callback, because I really knew the characters I was impersonating because I have watched the show so much, you know, um, I think it's always harder when you audition for shows that you don't, that you don't, you're not really that familiar with because you don't really understand the nature of how to play the material. And if, you know, I think that I had such, um, such a deep well to draw from because I was such a big fan of all the Star Trek shows. And so, you know, like next generation, I mean, I probably, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen every episode of that series. You know, like I, I'm, I'm very, I feel like what I was able to bring to it, I didn't have to work that hard for it because I knew the show so well is that I really understood the style of how to play the material. Does that make sense? Yes. Like you cannot go into that Star Trek environment and not really understand stylistically how to play the material. It's a very specific style. And frankly, I will uh, liken it to playing Shakespeare, right? It's very heightened. It's heightened language. Um, you know, you can't comment on it. You can't make fun of it. You can't, you know, like you have to approach it um, like the great dramatic plays, right? You, you, it, it is a television play. It's not a sitcom. It's not, you know, it's not an episode of Law and Order, right? Like it's its own, it really is its own um, 
style. And so although you're right that I was playing roles within a role, and that was really fun and challenging and exciting, I was impersonating people that I already knew really well. And this is why it's great to talk to a Trek fan. Yeah, like that's where being a Star Trek fan really paid off, you know, with that audition. Because I, I knew... I knew the characters really well. So then it was really more, for me, it was harder to work on the con artist person, not the people she was impersonating. That was easier. It was, it was harder to make decisions and character choices about who Dala was when she wasn't being someone else. That was harder because you have to decide, right? As the actor and for your audience, what are you going to offer that character when they're not being an, a con artist? Who are they? How do they live in the world? Very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of choices you have to make, as you said. These these episodes here represent your, unfortunately, only two uh, contributions to the Star Trek universe, which is very sad because you are, of course, a wonderful actress and would have loved to see you more. Uh, had you been offered any of the roles on future Trek shows? No, otherwise I would have done them. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I would have jumped at any opportunity to uh, to work with those creative teams and those people again. Well, it's not too late, you know? so we got to find best, someone who's undiscovered to get you on that show. Best. That's right. I mean, you know, seriously, like, it, look, look at the actors that have been on all those shows. Look at the writers. Look at the directors, people like Kim Friedman, and, you know. Uh, I mean, those are the people who are working at the highest level of our industry and our art form. They are quite well, the best of the best. What could be better? Than working with people of that caliber, it makes you better. I, you know, I'm I'm a better actress because of that opportunity. I feel like I got better at what I do because of it. So, besides your Star Trek work, you've also gone on to work on Wings, Jag, The Practice, a whole list of other shows. But uh, in particular, the two uh, TV shows I'd like to talk to you the most about are actually your Spin City appearance and your appearance on Diagnosis Murder, which you alluded to earlier, and you got to work side by side with Dick Van Dyke. Um, and I'm not sure if I, I haven't been able to see your Spin City episode. I, I don't know if you got to interact with Michael J. Fox at all, but I'm just curious. You can just tell us a little bit about being on those shows and uh, especially I really want to know what it's like to work with Dick Van Dyke. Well, working with Dick Van Dyke is, you know, again, it was like working with Angela Lansbury, like one of the great opportunities in my career. I grew up watching the Dick Van Dyke show. So, you know, again, that was another one of my dad's favorite shows. <laughs> I was a huge Mary Tyler Moore and Dick Van Dyke fan. Um, he was, that was just a fun set to work on because he, he sits around and tells stories all day. And so, you know, you can ask him anything and he would just tell amazing, amazing stories about his days in the industry and his experiences. And, you know, so that was pretty amazing. Um, and then wings is kind of fun just cause I've been friends with Steven Weber and Alan Ruck, my whole professional career. Um, Alan Ruck and I played husband and wife in a Hallmark film called The Ransom of Red Chief and Haley Joel Osment was our son and Michael Jeter and Christopher Lloyd were in it. I mean, it was a really great, um, so it was really fun to like play his, his wife a second time. <laughs> and Stephen Weber and I, I actually made my Broadway debut playing opposite Stephen Weber um, in a William Inch play called Come Back Little Sheba. So we've been friends since I was like 20. Um, and so then getting to work with him again on Wings was, you know, it was just fun because I was around old friends and and I was just really, really great. And Stephen and I were on Broadway again at the same time. Years later, he was doing the producers when I was doing Noises Off. And we used to meet, you know, for drinks after the show and hang out and tell stories and catch up. You know, uh, he was just a dear friend of my family's for many years. So that was, that was just a fun show to be on. As we mentioned earlier in the show, uh, you, as well as your mother, have been on three episodes of three different Law & Order shows, uh, SVU, Criminal Intent, and, of course, just good old classic Law & Order Vanilla. Um, so can you just talk to us about what it's like working on a Law & Order style show? Uh, it's, in my head, I imagine it's a much more kind of like more regimented, small little bits and pieces kind of a show. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, you're shooting all over New York and on locations primarily, and they're moving you know, pretty quickly to get those episodes done in the period of time that they have to shoot them. Um, so it's kind of like a well-oiled machine, you know, um, really fun, you know, but you're right. You're very regimented. Um, and, you know, those, those principal actors are working their butts off, you know, 
they're just like in every scene and working 15 hour days uh, or longer. And, you know, you've got to really admire the stamina of those actors to do what they do. Um, and so as a guest star, you know, you always feel like your job is to make their job easier so that they can get home to their kids and take a nap, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> seriously. Seriously. Um, yeah. It was, it was a really great experience. Now, as we've gone through all this episode, we've kind of neglected to really touch a lot on a lot of your theater work, especially your musical theater work. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about some of that because you've gotten to work on some great Broadway and off-Broadway productions. You even got to work alongside Patti Lapone, the legend. Uh, but the show I want to really specifically talk about is a very unique one, and that's Bat Boy, which uh, you know our co-host of Trek Back Tuesday on Nerd News Today, Andrea, she actually got to see you perform in that show, and she loved it. And it's such a bizarre messed up kind of show. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about being in Bat Boy and what it was like to be in just such a very unique production. I, I don't even know how to describe it beyond that. It was really fun. Yeah, Bat Boy was based on the Weekly World News story about a child who's half bat, half boy. Uh, it's sort of a comedic, sparse kind of crazy story. Um, it was just one of the great experiences in the theater. Yeah, I met my husband on that show. He was also in the cast. Just that whole cast was incredible, and they've all gone on to having amazing careers in theater, film, and television. Almost all of them across the board have had huge careers. Um, and yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny. There's that was you happen to pick a show where I'm still really, really, really close friends with all of the people that were in that cast. We we got very close, um, and some of that was because the show the nature of the show was very collaborative, but also um, 9-11 happened while we were uh, doing that show. And I think, you know, that was a, a life altering event for everyone. And I think it bonded us all in a very um, significant way. Um, but yeah, that, that, that show is just so much fun. And, you know, I, I didn't do that many musicals in my career, but the musicals that I did do, were I was really lucky that they were all really kick ass. They were that was just a badass part. <laughs> it was so fun. She was so fun and funny. Yeah, and for folks who are into musical theater and you haven't heard Bat Boy, I recommend you guys check it out. It kind of fits in nicely and, and almost forms a trilogy with the Evil Dead musical and the Toxic Avenger show. So worth hunting down. You can hear it on YouTube and among other places. But I'd like to fast forward now to recent times where you are now head of the musical theater department at Texas State. So uh, let's just talk about how you got there and what you're doing these days. Great. Ten years ago, I was asked to create a BFA in musical theater for Texas State University. And my husband and I came and built this program together. And we're now in the top five programs in the country, which I'm very proud of. Um, and we get to train young artists to go out into the world and, uh, you know, make good art. And <laughs> And it's been an amazing opportunity here to to really take what I love and do best and, and teach it, you know, and to be an educator, to pass on to young artists um, what I've learned over the years and to be able to direct and produce new work here. has been a real gift. And I'm also uh, president of Fontas Dry Throat Lozenges, which is a throat lozenge company that I uh, created since I've been at Texas State and also livingmentalwellness.com, which is a, it's a, mental wellness program for uh, for artists, for anybody, actually. Athlete, it was originally designed for athletics and artists, and um, it's a developmental model that um, deals with six different life skills, um, goal setting, time management, communication, coping skills, leadership skills, problem solving skills, and teaches mindfulness techniques, the science of the brain, what happens to your body under stress, and that company is something that I developed here as part of the curriculum and is now available. Um, you know, other schools, other programs, other individuals are, are now utilizing that, that curriculum uh, to help people have a stronger mental, mental wellness in their lives. Um, so that's something that I've been very proud of that I've done here. I did a TED Talk actually a few years back related to mental health and performing artists, and that sort of led me to um, collaborating on this curriculum. Yeah, we just mentioned that TED Talk, and again, you guys can watch that on YouTube as well as if you if you look up Caitlin's name, you'll be able to find a lot of productions that she directed at Texas State. But uh, just real quick to talk about that TED Talk, that's essentially about mental health 
for students who are going to college and just mental health for young people in general. So, uh, you know, can, you, can we just touch a little bit about what you discussed in that talk and why this has been such an important issue for you to advocate? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I care very much about. Um, you know, the transition from high school to college for students is a very stressful time. They're away from home for the first time. Uh, statistically, uh, most mental illnesses get triggered between the ages of 14 and 22. Uh, you know, the large majority of college students uh, report, you know, dealing with levels of stress, depression, anxiety. And I was looking for solutions on how to help my students um, navigate the stressors in their lives so that they can be healthier and have have more success in the work and the things that they love. You know, artists are, uh, you know, three times more likely to st- struggle from mental health issues, addiction issues, eating disorders, um, and there are a lot of other high-risk demographics, you know, athletes, first responders, um, business majors, uh, nurses, doctors, lawyers, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are in very high stress um, professions. And I think it's been a mission of mine to change the way that we educate students at university and help them develop these life skills because research proves that if you increase their life skills, you decrease their mental health symptomology, the anxiety and depression goes down. Um, when you increase your your life skills. Um, so that's just, you know, it's been um, something I've been very passionate about and cared very much about and wanted to make a difference, you know, out there in that area um, educationally. And, and so that was sort of how I went about doing that. Well, Caitlin, I'm glad that you're really passing on a lot of your knowledge to students as well as you teach and also to be passing on ways to mentally take care of yourself. Uh, it's a really important issue. Yeah. So as we bring this interview to a close now, I would like to ask you the most important question. That's what has been the best part of being a part of the Star Trek universe? The fans. The fans, without a doubt. Because you get to meet so many amazing people. Um, I've never been to one of the Star Trek conventions. Like this August will be the first time that I've you know, been invited and had an opportunity to go. And I'm, I'm just super excited because I love people and I love hearing people's stories and I don't know, just creating a, I love community. And I think the best part about Star Trek is that the community that it creates, you know, it's like you, you have this community of people all over the world who, I don't know, who care about Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Like, and that's really cool. Um, yeah. So I, I think, and I think, you know, just being part of that legacy, I think what I talked about earlier in terms of the messaging of that show um, is something that I really stand for and, and believe strongly in. Um, so I think just being part of that legacy is, is maybe the thing that would be the answer <laughs> to your question. <laughs> I just love that I learned yeah. that you are such a big Star Trek fan also, and it's great to know that someone who's worked on oh, the show has had so much love for it as well. Yeah, indeed. So, Caitlin, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really great learning so much about you. I wish we had more time just to go through your entire Broadway resume and your off-Broadway resume, because that's very impressive as well. But that'll be for another oh, show, I thank hope. thank you. I hope so, too. Thank you so much again, you and bet, uh, thank you for your service to the Dominion as well. Uh, it was my, it's been my pleasure to serve the Dominion. And uh, hey, from your mouth to God's ears, that maybe I get to do another episode sometime down down the road. Wouldn't that be something? Let's make it happen. Caitlin, thank you so much for your time. All right. Thanks, Matt. Take care. Caitlin's appearance on Deep Space Nine on the ship almost didn't happen, as the part originally called for Eris, the first female Vorta we saw back when that species and the Jemadar first debuted in Season 2. That actress, Molly Hagen, was unable to return for the role, and as Caitlin alluded to, changes were made, and instead of casting another actress in the same role... They were an entirely new character. Caitlin's Voyager appearance also has an unseen callback to Deep Space Nine, as the set of Dalla's fake Delta Flyer was actually a redress of the Defiant Bridge. And for those who are curious, if you want to see a photo of Caitlin dressed as 7 and 9 from that deleted scene we talked about, you could find that image on her official website. And once again, we'd like to send our deepest condolences to Caitlin Hopkins and her family during these tough times. So thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trek Untold. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the show. And if you can, leave a review and rating. We'd appreciate it very much. You can also follow us on social media. Just look for Trek Untold on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you and let us know what you think about the show. If you'd like to support this podcast, check out patreon.com slash trekuntold 
Let's learn how you can keep our ship operating at full power. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions, and shout out to Scott Ray for setting up this interview. If you'd like to book this week's guest for a convention appearance or an autograph signing event or anything else, you can email Scott at scottray67 at aol.com. This has been Trek Untold. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and until next time, fortune favors the bold.